Sermaye Piyasaları, Riskler ve Fırsatlar konulu paneli açacağız. İsimlerinizi okudukça konuklarımızı podyuma davet etmek istiyorum. I would like to kindly invite the speakers of the second panel up to the podium as I read out the names. Moderasyonu yapmak üzere CNBC'den Sayın Artunç Kocabalkan, Abu Dhabi Menkul Kıymetler Borsası Başkanı Sayın Raşed Albalushi, Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nden Nasdaq OMX Grup Başkan Yardımcısı Sayın Sandy Meyer Fruker, Almanya Frankfurt Borsası Deutsche Börse Grup'tan Yönetim Kurulu Üyesi Sayın Frank Gerstenschlager, İngiltere'den BNP Paribas Gelişen Piyasalar Strateji Başkanı Sayın Marshall Godet, İMKB Başkanı Doktor İbrahim Turan ve NYSC Başkan Yardımcısı Roland Belgrade'i bekliyoruz efendim podyuma. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to host and the moderate those speakers. Very proud, very profound, very gifted. And we would like to be very specific about the issues. I mean, let's start with the risks and opportunities in a fragile world. What is the fragility? What is the risk? What is the opportunity? I mean, the knowledge is the most important thing. And the cooperation between countries, corporations, stock exchange, and financial centers are very important. For that reason, I would like to start with the first guest from the head of Emerging Markets Equities and BNP Paribas, Martel Gojet. Please, sir. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon and to uh, exchange those views on uh, the developments of uh, markets and uh, obviously stock exchanges in particular. Um, the role of uh, stock markets and uh, exchanges uh, um, is growing rapidly as a consequence of the financial crisis that we had in 2008 and 2009. And uh, it is now clear for everybody that more transparency, uh, more shared rules among the actors, more prices available, more fair value among investment is something that is, has become a necessity to make sure that we get uh, more trustworthy uh, financial markets that will function better than they did in the past. Obviously, uh, would uh, information related to prices, to volumes, to open positions uh, have been widely available on um, all asset classes before the crisis? A lot of signals would have been sent to investors and to the financial community on the risks that was embedded by the kind of, uh, let's say, developments of the global economy between 2002 and, and 2007. Uh, as a result, we now have the development of uh, many listed products. Uh, and on my field, I can talk about what is happening in the derivative product field uh, with a clear shift from, uh, let's say, OTC products towards um, uh, uh, listed products. That's very true in the uh, equity space and equity derivative space. That's very true on any asset related to volatility. But that's also now very true on the fixed income side. Uh, we all have in mind the kind of efforts that are put in place to have now some listed uh, products on CDS. Um, and uh, we think that this is uh, clearly the right direction for markets uh, uh, into the future. Um, there are many sub-asset classes that are being developed uh, quite rapidly at the moment that were not existing in the past. Um, as we had the development of CDS uh, between, let's say, 1998 and 2008, we now have the development of products related to dividends, for example, that become very interesting. Um, a lot of products on volatility, very complex product to some extent, are also being developed. And it's very important that, that those developments take place um, within uh, the community of listed markets uh, in order to make sure that people speak with the same conventions, conventions that they use the same methodologies, that they can rely on uh, prices that are disclosed on a regular basis for investors. Uh, so definitely this is a progress and a major change in the way um, 
uh, uh, exchanges are working. That's very true for uh, developed market exchanges, but that's also very true for emerging market exchanges, and we see uh, very interesting developments in, uh, in many of those regions. Okay. Um, I'll ask you three questions right after uh, the speech of other attendants. First, what is the definition of a credible market? Credible market. And also, do you think that it's a good trend taking instruments from OTC to listed markets? And last, uh, do you think that mark to market, for example, this uh, bills and bonds market for the countries is a good way of solving this problem or stop pricing them well, mark to market? Okay. And then, uh, Mr. Gerstan Schlager, Frank Gerstan Schlager, member of the board, Deutsche Börse. Here you are, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. The goal of this um, summit here in uh, Istanbul is about talking about challenging facing the European securities market. And I thought it's quite uh, interesting for you to take one shot of our presentation, which we brought to the Exchange Council of the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. You could uh, probably see here and discuss on you what we think how the future might change, particularly in these equity markets. The major three building blocks are typically listing and trading services for securities, the clearing services, and the settlement services. So the entire process chain of buying and selling securities. On the listing and trading, we think that um, the limited funding capabilities of the banks will it more attractive as well for the real industry to further come back to the capital markets in a way of IPOs, capital increases, and of course, of listing of corporate bonds to the capital market. The major change we see on the clearing side is absolutely clearing will be the key for Europe to consolidate more flow into different trading venues and consolidate Europe across the different countries. And settlement, the major change will be the introduction of Target 2 securities will change a lot in the old processes of the different CSDs. So the four drivers you could in a charge um, the market structure. We believe that the market structure which was introduced with Mifid in 2007, where it was possible to have trading venues, several trading venues trading the same security. We support competition to the market in Europe. However, the flip side of that coin was the fragmentation. And the fragmentation of liquidity and the fragmentation of this world will happen and stay in Europe. We will see initiatives going up to set up additional trading venues as well in the future. Technology-wise, will that be really the challenge because this additional fragmentation in the market will drive complexity, which we already have in the trading room, but we will see that complexity as well and risk management in the future, and we will see more of this uh, complexity as well in surveillance and compliance with specific rules. The market, we believe, overall will recover. We see now in Europe, of course, the low volumes. We have the lowest volume since 12 years on the equity market, but we are quite sure that this is not a structural issue. It is a cyclical issue that these markets come back. And regulatory environment, of course, after MIFID in 2007, the new MIFID regulation, MIFID II, which we probably in place 2013-14, will have an impact on other asset classes, which so far not under MIFID regulation for transparency rules. And we will see, as you mentioned already, for an email, that the shift from the OTC market come to more light trading menus. Of course, the next years, the financial crisis will not be over. The financial situation, what we call it now as a type of financial de-stress, we'll see, of course, a lot of discussion on new regulatory framework for the financial market. If it starts now with short selling rules, it will be further on with financial transaction tax, it will go over high frequency trading and any other additional capital requirements in it. So driver financial distress, regulatory impact. And the customers will change and have already changed as well. The customers, which are called the issuers, the issuers want a more services from the financial industry to finance their business. If it's now own capital as an IPO or listed company, or is it um, capital which was brought to the company by corporate bonds. The retail investors, 
would like to have more access to several markets, less complexity and cheaper processes to participate in the overall trading environment. And of course, the institutional investors, they expect excellent execution situation and a very tight and reliable process overall with very low market impact on it. So overall, that will be the drivers for the next three, four years on our European uh, security market. Herr Gerstan Schlager, danke sehr. <laughs> and I'll ask you the impact of this financial crisis regarding the transactions in the Deutsche Börse. And also, is there any protest or something like that from the other companies from Greece and from Italy to uh, be listed in the Deutsche Börse or not? And also, <laughs> and also uh, do you think that if uh, Central Bank, uh, sorry, uh, if Istanbul Stock Exchange would, you, would like to make a cooperation with you, I mean, uh, as a new uh, financial center, it might be a good idea. What is the risks? What is the opportunity? I'll ask those questions. And Mr. Roland Belagade, is correct pronunciation? Belgard. Belgard, sorry. And you are the executive vice president of the NYC, uh, and, what, and your introductory speech, please. Okay, so thank you very much. I would like to step back to the title of this uh, panel, which is Capital Markets, Risk and Opportunities. I think it's very important first to look at what are the markets today and recognize the new global realities. First, there is a lot of correlation between the different markets in the world. What do we mean by correlation? It's the tendency of markets to move in tandem. Whatever happens on one side is reflected in other markets quite quickly. So today, we, when you have an, uh, a problem in one of the, the financial zones, be it in the US or in Asia or in, in Europe, it tends to propagate quite quickly. It means that a financial problem can, act, can go cross-border very quickly and very rapidly. And no one can deny that. But at the same time, one of the other global realities we are facing is that the emerging markets are opening their financial markets. They are basically trying to have more capital flow, uh, flowing in their country. They are trying to take advantage of this new capital. We are talking about creating a financial center. So it's all the same words about attracting capital, attracting financial activities. So you can hear and see it already. Opportunities about opening markets, risk about propagating crisis. So this landscape basically, as I said, creating advantages and challenges. And what are the real, I would say, the starting by the risks? What kind of risk can you face? Referring to a study made by the, the World Bank in 2010, the number of financial crises, banking crises, over the last 30 years tend to increase. The numbers in the 80s, there were 45 identified major systemic banking crises. In the 90s, 60 major systemic banking crisis. In the first half of 2000, it's already 35. So the tendencies of an increasing, increasing number of banking crises. So the, the real risk, to say it in, a, in different words, that regulation is still very local, but the markets are really very global. And regulators and exchanges, and everyone is facing this complexity of having national borders, national regulation, but markets, activities, financial markets being much more global than ever. So the, definitely there is a need for much better cooperation between the financial institutions, between the regulators, between the authorities. And to be more specific, it's cooperation around disclosure, about transparency. The, the trend in financial markets is to increase the opacity and to have a fragmentation. The trend should be cooperating around transparency, disclosure for companies, coordinated approach to manage risk in the same way and appreciate it the same way across the different zones, but equally harmonization of accounting rules. It's a long-term objective. It's not easy to get there. But if you want to have seamless investor investing in many asset classes across the world, they need to have benchmarks and they need to be able to compare those assets. So finally, if you look at the opportunities, Capital markets are basically, it's about connecting 
those who have some capital who would like to invest with those that can use this capital to turn ideas in businesses and creating growth, economic growth, meaning employment. So that's about the capital markets. What is the role of an exchange? And I like a lot the slide made by Frank. It's exactly about bringing together the investors and the, save, the people who are saving and the capital to bring to the, the capital to these people to invest and create new opportunities and new businesses. An exchange is, I've heard that this uh, also at the beginning of the, the, the presentation, creating and listing and trading products. It's not only about trading products, it's about companies. Companies which are looking to be, to be funded, companies which are looking for capital to invest and in creating jobs. That's the first priority. So you should not forget that an exchange, it's also servicing the issuers community. And it's as important, if not more important, than just the secondary market, which is about trading, trading, an opportunity to have, a, uh, to resell your assets. But the priority is to first invest and create uh, jobs and create a, the, the funding mechanism for companies. So one of the elements why, as an exchange, we are looking at this evolution of financial markets between risk and opportunities and is that we are trying to globalize, creating connections, creating partnerships with other exchanges in the world to try to help developing these activities. And obviously for us at the same time benefiting from this. So that's the link for us as an exchange of creating partnerships. We have done it in the past in many parts of the, the world, in Asia, in the Middle East and in Europe. And that's the way we can really help the community to fund the companies, and at the same time, creating infrastructure that is safe, reliable, transparent, and better for the investors. Thank you very much, sir. Two questions. First one, what about the, this quantitative trading is the most important uh, question, I think. Uh, are we expecting to see any fat finger? For example, uh, if this cooperation and the exchange of knowledge between the stock exchanges are very crucial, but it means that you can take this uh, very local risk to the uh, transfer to other uh, stock exchanges or something like that. And then, uh, what is the uh, average rate of new listed companies in the New York Stock Exchange as we are trying to attract new companies, exactly SMEs, to the Istanbul Stock Exchange. What's your average rate? Skip. Okay. And thanks, Ibrahim Ojam, that is the host and my teacher. And he transfers his, uh, yeah, Chair to the Mr. Mayor. Hi. Uh, my name is Sandy Frischer. I'm uh, Vice Chairman of uh, NASDAQ OMX. Uh, one of the risks of speaking on a panel is that you're way down the line in a panel, and uh, the other speakers, if they were any good, basically have said all that there needs to be said on the subject. Uh, so that is my first crisis. Uh, the opportunity is to try to say something different. Um, uh, I'm now going to take a real risk and try to translate a joke using a French word which I'll mispronounce and then having it translated into Turkish. So it's often said that one man's poison is another man's poisson, which effectively is someone's crisis and is another person's opportunity. Now, when I looked at this topic, crisis and opportunity in capital markets, I started scratching my head because there are so many different players that it's hard to define who's crisis and who's opportunity. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that one crisis that exchanges face is that because of products that entered the marketplace that were not on stock exchanges, the world has gone through four years of economic turmoil, actually it's six at this point, years of economic turmoil, as a function of non-regulated products where nobody could manage to calculate the risk at the end of the day, and where no one even internal to the companies understood the magnitude of their risks. 
And so the opportunity for markets in that regard is to present ourselves to the world for what we are. We are a marketplace where you do have rules, you do have regulation, you do have surveillance, and you have mark to market at the end of every day so you can calculate your risk. Had the world had all of these swaps and other kinds of interesting products listed on exchanges, we'd all be happier today. Now, the risk for a stock exchange is that money, as we have observed, flows from, has been flowing from exchanges to not only to other <coughs> asset classes and opportunities on a global basis. Because the fact of the matter is, is that stock exchanges are confined to a jurisdiction, as my friend from the New York Stock Exchange pointed out. Money is global, regulation is local. And so it's hard to offer global opportunities to individuals within the narrow geography of your exchange. So that is a crisis that requires a response, an opportunity. One opportunity is globalization. That's what New York has done. That's what NASDAQ has done. Both New York and NASDAQ were monopoly boutiques in their own countries where they sold one product called equities. And uh, they found that when something terrible happened in our marketplace, it was called competition. Oh my goodness. We all of a sudden figured out that we really had to have real technology, real transparency. And in fact, we had to go global. So the opportunity was, is to go beyond uh, your region. The other thing that people have discovered in the exchange world is that you have a crisis if you're only doing one asset class. So if you look at what's happening here in Turkey, you see that the Turkish government and the exchanges and the community has recognized that exchanges have to be multidimensional that they have to include multiple asset classes, that it has to have world-class technology to compete, and it has to be able to compete in, in a world where your technology has a basic foundation in which multiple asset classes can be traded. You have to be able to compete with your technology as new trading modalities develop. When I ran the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, I could not believe the volume that an auctions exchange had to be able to deal with because of the multiple uh, strike points that you had for options. We were doing, we had to have 10 times the robustness of an equity exchange in terms of compete. So we had to develop world-class technology to deal with that. And then finally, when we cured that problem, oh my goodness, High frequency technology started to hit the marketplace, and then we had to figure out how we were going to double, triple, quadruple, and keep going on the time, the speed, and on the volume that the exchanges could handle. And yet, high frequency trading, while a curse to many types of investors, from an exchange point of view, it is troublesome, but on the other hand, it provides significant enough um, flow that it is also an opportunity. So in this world, uh, crisis does, in fact, create opportunities. In the world of even a monopoly kind of exchange, an exchange that has one market, a significant market, but does not have competition within that market, people think that's called heaven. If you talk to somebody, an older person, now, when I say that, we're talking about people in their hundreds. But if you look at somebody who used to trade at the New York Stock Exchange or at NASDAQ, they decry that good, the good old days when everybody had to trade through them. Well, if you're in Turkey, you have a market that is robust, but somebody with capital can take that capital and trade it anywhere in the world. So there is no such thing as a monopoly in the world of finance or in the world of money because you're not competing strictly against likes. You're cre you are competing against real estate in Rio de Janeiro or 
um, I don't know, some sort of exotic, you know, kangaroo futures in Australia. The fact of the matter is, is that people who have money to invest have a world of investment opportunities. And so exchanges have to be able to be creative, they have to be able to be flexible, they have to offer a wide enough range of products, they have to have technology that can deal with it. And when I come to Turkey, I'm really excited to see your market uh, and the process here that is growing to become a world-class market to meet the crisis and to avail themselves of the opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, two, two, two questions for you. Um, you were talking about this poison idiom. Uh, do you think that the global crisis is a zero-sum game or there will be a win-win process? And this is, this is one question. And then, uh, do you think that, for example, Istanbul Stock Exchange is being uh, planned as the uh, mother uh, stock exchange? Uh, having the futures and options under the uh, roof of Istanbul Stock Exchange. Do, do you believe that separate stock markets like Nasdaq, Chicago, and New York, or one roof, just one stock exchange for all the uh, transactions is the better way? And also, you were uh, underlying the importance, the comp competition between Rio and Istanbul. Uh, do you think that real estate is a bubble all over the world and, and, or a new opportunity to invest? Now, do you mean real estate as a bubble as yeah. distinct from, say, the tech bubble? Yeah, exactly. No, a bubble is a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I, An analytical definition. An analytical definition. An analytical definition. <laughs> okay, I need another uh, definition for the uh, financial center. W what is uh, the risk and opportunity to try to be a financial center for Istanbul? Okay? Okay, can I answer it? Okay. The answer is it's a risk not to not be. Now. Oh, why not? You, you're going to talk about it and then do the second <laughs> round. As my time Wait a second. But if I think about it, you may not get as good an answer. <laughs> You know, he, he, he's my teacher. He's correct. <laughs> okay, let's skip to Rashid El Balushi, Chief Executive of Dubai Securities Exchange. Rashid, Rashid. Okay, Rashid, exactly. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Rashid El Balushi. I am the Chief Executive of Abu Dhabi Securities Exchange. One of the opportunities uh, that we see in the GCC generally and Abu Dhabi specifically is the bond market. Uh, as you are all uh, aware of, the bond market is very active nowadays in GCC. As a matter of fact, the first half of 2012, $37.6 billion bond were issued, bond and sukuks were issued in the GCC. Abu Dhabi counted to be the first, or UAE counted to be the first with 8.5 eight, with 8 billion. Then Saudi Arabia with 8 billion, and Kuwait with 4.4 uh, billion. So the, the, the, the issuance of Sukuk and bond in the GCC is very active. And the expectation is even going higher, because if you look at the study of, made by Ernest and Young, they're saying the demand, the global demand on Sukuk only this year is about $300 billion, while the issued Sukuk so far is about $100 billion. So if you look at the supply and demand, we see more people looking for uh, Sukuk. I'm talking about Sukuk only in this case. And this study is, is expecting uh, uh, the Sukuk market to reach $900 billion by 2017. So you could imagine what does that market mean to us as the GCC and as Abu Dhabi? But if you go down deep, if you look at the problems of the, of the, of the GCC markets, you see that the presence or the participation of bonds and sukuk almost zero. They don't, they don't exist. Why? Because all of the issuers, they're interested to issue, list, and trade them outside the GCC, mainly in London. 
So the question comes to us, do we need them? I think, yes, we do. Because if you look, if you compare between Sukuk and uh, bonds with the equity market, you always see the correlation is against each other. What does that mean? When the value, when the, when the performance of stocks goes up, that means the performance of the uh, bond normally goes, do goes down, and vice versa. When the incentive and when the uh, performance of the stock goes down, we see and we notice, and the, uh, when you compare the, the, the stock exchanges that combine both, we see the performance of the bond and school goes up, which means at the end of the day, the liquidity will stay in that exchange. The liquidity will, will, will exist and will make people happy, will make everybody happy. But when it comes to our situation, we see it differently. As a matter of fact, in Abu Dhabi, we've done studies. When we, when we saw the market goes down, suddenly we see the money goes out. But, uh, and it goes to the banks, because that was the only alternative for that money to go to. So the question that we are trying to, or the, the, or, or the GCC has to, to find an answer to how to encourage, how to uh, see the markets with two options, at least having school and bond in one hand, as well as the equity in the other hand. That's my observation. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Do you think that there is a correlation between the oil prices and the scook and the bond demand in terms of uh, in, the, in the GCC countries? And also, do you think that, for example, Istanbul Stock Exchange uh, and the, uh, there will be a competition or cooperation in terms of this scook and this bond market. Okay. My teacher, please. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, well, it's, it's my honor and privilege, of course, to be with you today. And I, I'm going to try to share some of my very humble opinions with you. I, I, I am sure there are there are several people who knows better than I do, but yet I, I am supposed to talk. I, I put myself at the last rank, hoping that time may be over uh, until, until it, it, it comes to me, but uh, no. all in all, we're going to talk. Well, uh, I see the situation in a two-dimensional way, uh, in, in terms of risks, in terms of fragilities. Because I'm going to talk about risks only, not opportunities, because I am not an entrepreneur. If, if I was able to see opportunities or to catch opportunities, I would not be in here, but rather making money somewhere else. So I am, as an ex-academician, ex-central banker, I can see risks, but unfortunately, not too much opportunities. You are not a risk taker, huh? Uh, obviously, obviously. <laughs> Well, uh, there, as I said, there are, it's a two-dimensional uh, space, I, I think. First of all, there is a conjuncture-related aspect of it in terms of risks and fragilities, and one more structural. Uh, when, when it comes to what is related with the existing circumstances and conjuncture, uh, let, let me tell you a fun story. It's about three friends living in the same house. One, a German, the second is uh, a British, and the third is an uh, Italian. And they make the organization, and uh, I mean specialization of labor. The German what, is taking care of organization and management. Uh, the British, the, uh, in terms of uh, external relations, and the Italian is taking care of cooking. Uh, well, and they were all happy. They are all happy. And uh, the thing is that the secret uh, formula is if you distribute the tasks accordingly. But if you mix them, uh, for example, if, if you give uh, the uh, I mean, the Italian to organization, British cooking, and the German 
uh, uh, for, for, forgive me, the uh, international relations, it, it will just be a different story. So uh, here I, I would like to praise my friend Frank, what he has plotted, what he has uh, put uh, into the screen uh, was really excellent to cover all the details in a very analytical and structured way. The only thing I can add to uh, the, this uh, quadruple chart is the macro uh, maybe dimension. What is the risk for us? Well, it, the risk for us is that the all governments are running huge deficits and number one priority for them is to ease the financing of these deficits. And guess what? They are all pushing towards more fixed income government securities, the, the making up of the market. And not only that, but also regulator, uh, regulatory uh, authorities, uh, both domestic level and, and international level, uh, for the sake of the liquidity, uh, uh, solving the problems related liquidity, they are also favoring fixed income government securities over other kinds of securities. So th those dynamics are really not of favor of the equity markets. And of course, stock exchanges are uh, impacted adversely. So uh, this is one issue, but uh, re related with the existing circumstances and conjunction. And the other one, more uh, maybe structural, of course, because of several reasons, all, all aging society, uh, because of uh, and aging society makes the, the investment uh, horizons shorter, so it's not good for equity investment. And uh, we, we can see it uh, throughout the allocation of uh, assets in even in more dedicated equity investors like uh, pension funds. Uh, compared to what they used to be, I mean, t 20 years ago, there is a drastic dec decline in their uh, equity holdings. But uh, th there is maybe a more important issue, which is that, uh, again, it is related with the very nature of the human beings. We, most of the time, tend to go too far. We, uh, in, in a way, uh, actually take things to their extreme. Uh, and we, we are doing the same in, in terms of the uh, restructuring of the uh, stock exchange or uh, the capital markets business. Of course, I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Sandy, that competition is good. But, I mean, at the end of the day, why we established as human beings, as, uh, I mean, economic units, something like stock exchange? Well, in order to have more tra transparency and price discovery. So if, if you I mean, fragment it uh, at, at such an extreme that, to, an, to such an extreme that, at the end of the day, it will, it will not be possible to have I, neither uh, transparency nor price discovery. So I think th there is a very, very good proverb in, uh, I mean, French language, which is, and Roland, the, uh, Avec, avec, avec, euh, I mean, la, la, la, euh, votre permission. Euh, chaque fois que le doigt montre la lune, les imbéciles toujours regardent le doigt. Am I correct? Every time that the finger points out the moon, the stupids always do look to the finger. And the competition is good for, for more efficiency. Competition is good for allocation economic resources in an appropriate way. But if at the end of the day competition works to just to the other way around, to, to kill the, uh, the efficiency of the market. So what is the clue to, to uh, I mean, continue in that direction? This, this is my open question. And, and uh, you know, as an academician, I, I like the questions more than the answers. I took the message. Okay. But I have a question. What does that French proverb uh, saying have to do with fish? <laughs> fish. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it's like bottom fishing or something like that? No, I, I have to say your point is very well taken. The fact of the matter is if you look at the U.S. markets, uh, when you, one of the areas if you want to look at crisis, you have to look at the fact that if you run a stock exchange and you simply run a stock exchange that was an equity market, you're out of business because it's a rush to the bottom because of competition in the United States. 
we have, you ready for this? 100 uh, over 100 separate trading modalities. Over 100. If you aggregate the, the stock traded uh, in equities on New York and NASDAQ, you get less than 50%. So competition is good, fragmentation is insane. And if you want to have markets that are solid, you can't have competition. Now, as I said before, you have competition even in a monopoly market because money goes everywhere. But when you add that, that's why you have New York, that's why you have NASDAQ, even the Deutsche Börse. Everyone's looking to global strategies because you simply, if you're simply going to run a stock market that does equities, forget it. It's just a horrible business with very few opportunities. And as for you not being a risk taker, if you were not a risk taker, you'd still be in the classroom. Okay. okay. Yeah, please. Yes, but, but at the end of today, uh, everybody now is discussing about how to bring more, how, how to say, emerging markets into the uh, global scene. And uh, in order to have a more balanced, sustainable, and stronger growth, everybody s says that we need emerging markets to kick in. But emerging markets de depend heavily on small and medium-sized enterprises. And the only way for them to develop their business is to have access over financial markets and most of the time equity markets. Because, uh, I mean, bank lending is very scarce and for them it's very difficult to have uh, uh, access over, over it. So uh, I think we still need a well-developed, efficiently, properly functioning equity markets. And uh, I mean, this should be number one consideration for all of us. All of us. Uh, Mr. Turhan, we are talking about the cooperation rather than competition right now. Do you think that there is a competition between the London Stock Exchange and the Istanbul Stock Exchange or cooperation will be there? No? Yeah. Well, both. Uh, there is a competition between exchanges. There is competition between organized and unorganized trading platform. There is a competition between unorganized platform, and there is a competition between the companies who are, which are listed into one of or uh, se several of those uh, trading venues. So it's a little bit com complicated. It's, it's like a solar system. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the planet turns around itself, and at the same time uh, uh, turns uh, around, make this circular movement around the star. And uh, there, are, there are orbits, etc. So it, it's really complicated. Uh, but yes, there are there are competition at, at each level. Okay, Mr. Gojet. Thank you. Uh, so I will try to answer to the questions that um, you asked me. Um, the, the whole three questions are very related, so I'll try to be short on that. Um, tradable markets, OTC versus listed, and mark to market is it good or bad? I think a very important point that was made previously was about the price discovery issue, and I think that's. Uh, the only reason why, uh, at the end, we we are there, and the second one would be maybe counterparty risk. Uh, obviously, we saw that uh, in the 2008 and 2009 crisis that uh, one of the major issues that were faced by investors uh, was the fact that they were ending up with the possibility of not being paid with the OTC contracts that they had been uh, uh, contracting uh, with some failing uh, uh, counterparties. Um, having said that. Um, there are some markets that, for some reasons, are not moving to the listed side. What comes to my mind is just the interest rate derivative swap market, which is one of the largest markets in the world. And all the attempts to have some kind of futures on swap index have been failing. On one side, you have massive bond futures indices that are used as hedge to uh, uh, the interest rate swap markets. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, um, th th those markets that have been trying to launch uh, on, on very popular maturities like five years or 10 years uh, uh, swap contracts have been failing. So for some reason, there are some markets that uh, can function well without uh, being, being listed. Um, having said that, I tend to think that, however, Mifid was also quoted. Um, we need to have more transparency for investors in terms of best execution. Uh, 
And obviously, having products listed on market is uh, the best way to ensure investors that there is transparency in the way um, the, the, the, the prices are, are constructed and disclosed. Um, but you can still have this debate on whether all, all markets should be, uh, uh, all products should be listed. I think that in the case of products that are not listed, you need to ensure that you have a very, very strong regulation and very, very strong re regulatory bodies that would make sure that there will be a disclosure of the positions on, uh, on those assets because otherwise it's going to, um, again, to uh, lead to some of the crisis. Uh, another idea that came to my mind is the story to, that happened to JP Morgan this year with the fact that within JP Morgan, two desks dealing with the same instruments, complex instruments on credit derivatives, ended with different valuations. So they could even trade one versus the other and having the, the, the, the feeling that they were making or losing money within the house, which obviously is just a, a nonsense. Uh, so obviously you need more and more um, homogeneity and way to challenge the way prices are constructed because otherwise you can end up with uh, um, false results and uh, abnormal position being constructed in, in institutions. Uh, obviously it happened at JP Morgan that is a massive bank with a lot of resources but the same amount of losses uh, occurring at a much smaller institution, it would, the institution would, be, would have disappeared nowadays. So uh, you can have a lot of debate on that uh, definitely and mark to market is it good or bad? Uh, I think it's not really the point. Uh, if you intend to sell the security you've been purchasing, uh, let's say in a short time horizon, yes, you need to be in mark to market. There's no clue about that. But otherwise, though the mark to market may be available, if you intend to keep to maturity, for example, an asset, uh, it's perfectly under understandable that you would uh, smooth or take the loss over time. And uh, this is not really an, an, a problem of being listed or in exchange or not. It's a problem of accounting regulation and proper work conducted by, by regulatory bodies. So I think the conclusion of this is that you need to have a very fine functioning between obviously the financial institutions that create and book those products. Uh, obviously the way they disclose the risk and the way they are going to price these products uh, to the clients. We all have in mind obviously all the uh, uh, trials that are underway in many countries uh, where municipalities, for example, are challenging the way uh, they've been sold and how some products have been revalued over time uh, by, some, uh, by some banks. We need to have also a very strong involvement uh, of regulators, which also means that as for stock exchange, they have the appropriate uh, level of technology and knowledge for those products to be able to challenge the banks. Uh, and you need to have the also appropriate um, accounting framework to make sure that those products are used in a nice way. Financial products are not bad, they're not evil. And when you read that in newspaper, it's, I just don't get the point. Uh, it's obviously just the way they are used, they are monitored, they are followed that can lead to very nasty situations. And obviously, we all want those situations to disappear. And in that context, definitely having more products on, on, on listed, listed on exchanges is definitely a good thing. As the, as the last question, um, uh, Mr. Rashid uh, said that the demand is increasing very rapidly in the GCC countries, bonds and crooks. Do you think that it's a good time to invest in European bonds or the GCC bonds? Okay. Uh, I'm supposed to be a specialist of emerging markets, but I can give you um, some feedback on that. Um, is it a good time to invest in European government bonds? On peripheral, on peripheral bonds, maybe, on core countries, you're not going to make a lot of money. And, uh, and most likely, you are going to lose money if inflation moves higher than the yields uh, that you get. So uh, you may have risk constraints, reasons on risk that would push you to do that. That's why we've been having negative interest rates in Switzerland as far as to the fifth five-year maturity, which is amazing. Can you imagine for five years having a negative interest rate? But for risk constraints, this is the situation that we've been having recently. Similarly, we had negative interest rates in German to your, to your yield because people were uh, needing to have this kind of security in the quality of the asset that they were buying to do something else, let's say. Um, so flight to quality can distort definitely um, level of prices to, uh, 
levels where you're not going to make money. Uh, peripheral countries, yes, if you think that the ECB uh, will do what uh, it stated uh, since, let's say, the end of July, yes, you can buy short-term uh, Spanish or Italian bond. Um, there's a risk of, for that, but obviously you also get the remuneration for it, so you're paid for, for the risk. Having said that, something very interesting that was mentioned, yes, is the development of the emerging market fixed income products. And uh, though emerging market equities have been disappointing both in terms of performances and flows over the past now two to three years, uh, emerging market bond funds have been performing very well and have been attracting massive inflows. Uh, so uh, yeah, you have, uh, you have both sides of the coins and there is still room to make money in emerging market fixed income. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Mr. Gerstenschlager, I know that German people are very good at uh, foreign affairs, <laughs> and what about what about the impact of this European crisis in terms of your uh, transactions, transaction volume of uh, Deutsche Börse? Yeah, of course. I mean, the financial crisis hit uh, the volumes massively from the exchanges. This is true for all exchanges in Europe. It's true for all exchanges globally. But similar, um, um, what we look for it is a two major impact. Oh, let's say it's one impact. Investors are not confident anymore in the market. That's number one. And investors have a portfolio and they don't change it now. They just don't trade it. They don't, they don't need to do hedges as well. They don't move it. They don't change it. They stay with the portfolio. So what we measure, for example, is the turnover on our DAX compared to the free float of all the capital of all these 30 stocks in the DAX. This is traditionally absolutely low at 0.8%. Usually it's at 1% or 1.2%. So it's the majority of the portfolio at our, our investors. It's a very, very low level. We think that it's not a structural issue. It's typically a cyclical issue of these crises at the moment. However, um, the second question was exactly cooperation on the exchanges. Crisis, financial crisis, yes or no, doesn't matter. There is a need for further cooperation of exchanges. Um, the biggest problem of exchanges, they are all unique. Yeah? They are unique by national regulation. They are unique by tradition. They are unique by national processes for good reasons. But however, we have to get closer to, to harmonize a lot of things to be really able to open up for institutional investors cross-border trades and other things. So we have to work together on that. It is over with the monopoly of having one market. It is, as I totally agree, it's competition of market. If we like that or we don't, doesn't matter. It's not, no discussion anymore. There is a competition in the market, and the competition in the market, however, cooperation makes sense. Cooperation, we believe, is the cooperation has to work on a, on a process level. So, mean cooperation in settlement, cooperation in risk management features. So, these are the typical cooperation uh, issues we will see. And um, coming to the crisis overall, uh, this crisis in Germany, in particular, or in Central Europe, is different than a lot of other financial crises we have seen in the last, I'm now 25 years in that business, because its major issue is in Germany, in particular, the real industry has no confidence anymore in the financial sector. This is absolutely new. So they don't trust the processes, so transparency will help that. For us, exchange providers will help that we could prove that we are part of the solution, that we are not part of the problem anymore in the future. However, we have to get more transparency in the market. It's not about bid and ask prices. It's about transparency of the rule book, transparency of the risk calculation, transparency of whatever volumes which have been traded in the dark so far. We have to recognize the industry want to see if a bubble coming up. The bubble will come up, but they want to see it earlier. That is really what they expect. In particular, in Germany, we have a huge pressure from really the, what we call the real industry on the financial sector to change behavior. And that's exactly where the politicians now come again and they listen mainly to the real industry and say, we want to see more action from the financial industry to cover this new world in the future and then regulators have to act. But in Europe it is, we need a European regulator. It is, will not help us if now our German regulators has a short selling ban because 70%, 70% of the business traded on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange is coming from members abroad. 
So I don't need a German short selling ban. That's is, is something complexity I don't need at all. Yeah? Same as financial transaction tax, same as high frequency trading. We need clear European regulations in the future. As the last question, do you think that is there a correlation between the uh, company values, I mean prices, and the inflation rate? The company trading prices? Yeah, exactly. No. I, I mean, it, it, I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no statistics on that. But uh, thinking about what trial really the value of the companies in Germany is really uh, what kind of possibilities they have to further on doing deals with China. There is a question of export. It's a, try, a question of the U dollar, US dollar to euro rate, you know. That's just a complexity, inflation. Not only. Exactly. What I'm trying to understand is if the inflation rate in the European area will go up. What's the impact for the... Uh, company prices, trading prices. I mean, my overall belief is that, that what I put on that slide, the equity market will come back. There are huge investors having a moment. Insurance companies in Germany, okay. insurance company in Germany or pension funds in Germany have a very very low equity exposure. I'm quite sure that they will increase their equity exposure. They need safe assets, and equity is volatile. Yes but they cannot spend all the money into real estate and commodities and they have to get out once out of these fixed income products so they will move to equities. So equity prices will go up if the uncertainty stays with the market. Okay, thank you very much. Well, would you like to comment this, uh, the same question? I said, I asked this question because two months ago I had the chance to talk to Mr. Roger Meyerson, one of uh, uh, Nobel winner. He said that, I don't know the United States, but for my calculations in the European area, a European Central Bank will print money to cause, I mean, roughly 10% of uh, price inflation. And, it, and uh, the potential growth rate of the European Union is 10% under the, its potential right now. For that reason, it's not good for me because I'm trying to save my uh, retirement but it's good for the companies, it's good for the countries, or something like that. I, don't, I would say that, I mean, more or less the same answer as Frank. I mean, longer term, if you have inflation, basically the fixed income products, which are fixed rate, will have to go down. So the, clearly people will start investing in equities, and normally over the longer run, the price of the equities would include part of the inflation. But all this is like economic theory. At the end, you, you still have other variables impacting including the what's going on on the individual company. So broadly, long term, yes. Short term, a lot of the exceptions to it. But I would like just to come back on one thing which was very important when you talk about exchange partnership and the role of an exchange, and you want to transform Istanbul as a financial center. I mean, transforming a, a marketplace as a financial center is not only about privatizing, uh, creating more uh, freedom for people to, to invest, for foreigners to invest. It's more than that. It's, proper regulation. And what's the meaning of proper regulation? It's not only about setting guidelines and, and that's it. You all know that in European markets and also in the US and everywhere, there's a competition between banking supervisors and security supervisors. And the whole shadow banking which is developed in Europe is the fact that those two types of supervisors never agreed between themselves. And if you look at uh, the way the products are created, I mean, we're just mentioning OTC products, but also products are not bad by themselves. That's true. But you need to understand where the brokers and the banks are making money out of those products. I will mean, take an example, ETFs, traded funds. Everyone thought that it's good to regulate the ETFs. It's good to say that an ETF should reflect the assets in the line, or if they have synthetic ETFs, they should really follow certain rules and be explicit and inform the investor. And everyone was happy that this is enough as a regulation. Practically everyone was forgetting what's happening behind, how the banks are hedging, how the banks are using the collateral to lend the money, and what's going on in terms of systemic risk. So not understanding the products, you're just ending up in doing a regulation which is just about informing. And that's not proper regulation. So building a financial center, it's, about, it's again privatizing, creating the right infrastructure, but equally understanding what are the key challenges. We have a trading exchange, you have securities, you have gold, you have uh, commodities, you, want to, you have the derivatives, and at the same time you have a clearinghouse with some banking functions. Look at what's going on across the world. You have in the US, the TCC, pure utility. Most of the banking functions are kept by the banks. 
a lot of added value over there. In Europe, it's slightly different, with a lot of competition in between the banks and the major custodians like Euroclear and Clearstream. So again, here, by setting up a financial center, you need to make a decision, political one about, which one do you, do you want to protect the investor, or do you want to have more of a banking system, or more of a system which is purely centralized on an exchange? All these are very key questions when you set up a financial center. And having the experience we have had, I mean, not the only ones, but to, to this, what happened in Europe and in the US, it's invaluable to set up the right infrastructure. I mean, we have, and the slide of Frank was also ex explicit, MIFID is a huge European regulation. Everyone is still arguing about MIFID 1, MIFID 2, but everyone forgets why this has been set up 10 years ago. The objective was quite simple. You get to one single financial market with one single currency. Objective is for companies, listed companies, to raise capital across a, border, a broader pool of liquidity, across all investors in Europe, having the same currency, able to invest in companies across all the markets, with a, which ends up in having a lower cost of capital. Where are we today? It's a fragmented market, opacity, and just basically seen as MIFID as a tool to compete against exchanges. That's not the objective. They, everyone forgot the initial objective. So setting up the right infrastructure, setting up a financial center, having a long-term view of where you want to be, and knowing where the added value is. Well, I'll go to that question on uh, yeah. financial centers. I had the, um, um, the opportunity in my life to have, uh, to not be uh, strictly a, a child of one industry. Uh, I worked in government uh, for many years, uh, and I also worked in real estate development. So I had the opportunity to build the World Financial Center in New York when I was president of the Battery Park City Authority. And then I worked uh, with Olympia in York when they built it. Uh, a financial center, uh, to be a financial center, is a very legitimate and important aspiration. Uh, it isn't just buildings. It's a location where people want to come um, because they have, they believe that A, uh, it's an opportunity uh, uh, and it's a good place to trade. Um, and the second is because it's a good place to live. And those two things come together, hand in glove. Now, I think, uh, I probably will get myself in a lot of trouble because there are a lot of people who support it or some people who don't. But the fact of the matter is, is that Istanbul is a wonderful location to have a financial center from a number of different vantage points. Um, it has uh, an educated population. Uh, it is a wonderful place to be, except if you're in a car in rush hour, which, by the way, stretches from 12 to 12. <laughs> um, it is a wonderful blend of the past and of the future. Uh, it is importantly and centrally located between two worlds who that if they don't come together will kill each other. Um, it's no accident that the World Federation of Exchanges reached out to a former head of the Istanbul Stock Exchange to run the World Federation of Exchanges because the board, which you're on, you're on, Deutsche Bourse is on, recognized that we wanted somebody who did not come from a very narrow perspective, but who could, in fact, have a global perspective and to help build the relationships between existing markets and emerging markets and between continents and maybe even between religions. So Istanbul should be a world financial center. Um, now, one of the criteria is, is that it has to have a futuristic market. Regulation and how you structure the regulation is critical uh, because if it has too many roadblocks, it will fail. If it doesn't have sufficient safeguards, it will fail. Uh, it has to have product to trade. And it has to have relationships into the global world. The Istanbul Stock Exchange uh, has been evolving into a 21st century exchange. I think, as I said in my opening remarks, 
the, uh, the decision to consolidate under one uh, umbrella, both the equities and the derivatives, is a very, very important step. Uh, the fact, uh, however, is that it has to be creative in terms of developing new product. I mean, we at NASDAQ have learned, I would think New York, uh, just watching their actions, they have learned you can't be a boutique. You have to be really a department store, really. Um, you have to recognize the limitations of your own market and the strengths of your own market. There's great strengths and opportunities in this market, but it is a market that will be slow or s slower than others in terms of bringing people to the point where companies want to be uh, IPOs. So it has to open itself up to new and creative kinds of project products like exchange traded funds and indexes. IPO, capital formation, is a very important and definitive um, uh, attribute or criteria to be a capital market. But let's remember, the capital formation on these markets is in the first millisecond after the IPO takes place. After that, it's trading. It's not capital formation. And that's where you get traders. The traders don't come for the IPO. The traders come for the post-IPO. So what you have is a need uh, to be able to have a market that's dexterous, that can move quickly, that can incorporate new products, that can entice people to come here to trade, that not only have primary products like equities, but also have hedge products, that have derivative hedge products and other kinds of products. It is the depth of the market, the opportunities that are created, uh, but do not forget the regulatory side, the stability side, and the quality of life side. Yes, sir. Your question about uh, the oil of the price, the price of the oil with the bond, of course, the, the, the oil is the backbone of almost everything. So uh, it has an effect on the bond and bond issuance. So if, we to, if, if I want to answer this question, it has many, many, many answers. But the way I look at it, when it comes to the government point of view, of course, when the, oil of, when the, when the price of the oil is high, they're not going to go ask for money. And as a matter of fact, the, the, uh, uh, the bond or scoop market might slow down. And you could argue the opposite, by the way. When it comes to the private sectors, if the price of the oil goes up, that means more infrastructure, that means more investment, that means different investment in different places. So that means companies need money, and bond will be one of the good alternatives. And since we're talking about the bond and the government, one of the, our, one of the problems that we face in Abu Dhabi, the government does not want to borrow. <laughs> so we don't have we don't have the dirham denominated bond. What we kind of government is that? Who doesn't that? want to borrow? That, uh, Very rich <laughs> <laughs> so so for the corporate bond, they cannot use a government bond as a benchmark. So this is one of the biggest challenge. And believe it or not, we've been trying to see a bond uh, related to the government. I would say since 2004 and we still keep trying. And about the competition or competing, competing with uh, Istanbul Stock Exchange, I had a chance to look at the note, one of the notes in the, in the, in the uh, booklets that I got from you, and I was surprised or it got my attention when I compared the value traded of equity versus the bond. Correct me if I'm wrong, it was 178 versus $2 trillion. That's not to me, that's to everybody. It's an opportunity to, to learn from the successful story. I see it as a, as a successful story. I see a very active bond market that uh, exchanges like us should take advantage of. So it's not competing, it is com trying to take advantage of that and trying to see how can we follow those steps and learn from the uh, mistakes. Mr. Turan, uh, actually, everybody's uh, talking about the Istanbul as a financial center. And we've been trying to set up a cooperation between many uh, stock exchanges. 
what, what is your aim? What, what are you trying to do? Well, I just try to reflect the wisdom of the past into the business field of the future. Well, to elaborate a little bit on what my brother Rashid has just mentioned, because this was the very same question I was asked in, Abu da in Dubai last week. They, they asked me whether the Turkish corporations, Turkish business, Turkish uh, stock exchange is a threat for the region or not. And I told, well, of course we are in competition. Uh, this is what Adam Smith mentioned uh, some 200 years ago, said that, well, out of the selfish behavior of human beings, you will end up with a virtue at collective level, co uh, societal level. But th they, there may be different kind of competitions. For example, uh, I mean, every uh, Turkish, uh, uh, everybody from Turkey uh, in, the, in the room uh, remembers it. There, there is a story about the two shopkeepers in Edirne. It was during the conquest of Istanbul that the church in Istanbul really had some worries, concerns, because everybody was aware that the Turks were trying to uh, prepare a campaign uh, for the Istanbul. And they sent two priests to uh, Edirne to understand better what is taking place. And they directly go to the bazaar because, as you know, in bazaar you, you can have every piece of information. It's, it's the price discovery uh, field. So they entered into one of the shops in the morning. And in order to uh, open up a discussion, a conversation, they uh, tried to buy something. And the shopkeeper very politely said that, you are welcome, you are our guest. I can offer you some tea, uh, some coffee, whatever you want. But please, uh, could, could you kindly just go to the next shop, my neighbor? Because uh, I have already sold something in the morning. Because this is a tradition of us. Uh, in the morning, when you make the first sale, we call it siftah. And it, it, it is very, I, I'm sure, familiar to uh, our uh, uh, brother Rashid. Siftah means the opening, opening sale. So the, the mentality was that I have already sold something, but I need my neighbor to keep on making business as well, because this is a bazaar, this is a market. This is not uh, only one shop. If, if you have, there is only one shop, it will be very difficult. It will be maybe unsustainable for the shopkeeper itself, himself. But if you have plenty of shops, making all business within competition, but such kind of a competition that, that does not exclude the collaboration at the same time. A win-win situation, as, as you described. So, and the, the press really amazed because the same happened when uh, they went to the second shop uh, and the second shopkeeper uh, dro drove them to the third one and so on and so forth. So, if we, if we can, as uh, I mean, exchanges, develop such kind of a network, an ecosystem, this will be the only way of surviving, believe me. Because otherwise, it will be not possible to compete from uh, the pressure, competitive pressure coming from unorganized markets. Because, for example, I, I know of the situation in, uh, let's say, in kayaks. And they are running a huge, huge market with less than 20 people. And I mean, they have nothing. Uh, and even kayaks is, in a way, organized compared to some dark pools or some MTFs uh, I mean, surrounding. So it will not be possible. And, and this is something very, very dangerous to me. Because, I mean, it's, it's early, earlier uh, mentioned all the, uh, already. But, you know, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, I don't remember any single G20 or IFSB uh, meeting, if, if I'm not, I, I, I'm wrong, please, uh, Mr. Governor, correct me, where 
the discussion was not about how to, uh, I mean, how to channel the unorganized markets, the, the products that is traded at unorganized markets towards exchanges, towards organized markets. This is number one agenda item in every single G20 IFSP meeting. But guess what? Since the startup of the crisis, the uh, turnover, the volume in unorganized markets has increased by 40%. So we are risking ourselves, believe me, because God forbid, if something bad happens, it will be really disastrous because we, we cannot survive another, another series of uh, I mean, troublesome or turbulent uh, atmosphere. So we should develop an, an ecosystem uh, for exchanges where everything will be open, will be ready to be shared. Everybody will, will make money. I, I do believe that there are plenty of opportunities, enough for everybody. So we, we, can, we can work together, we can uh, walk together. And uh, the, the very reason why I am trying to establish uh, this kind of uh, interlinkages between exchanges, this is number one. And the, the number two is that, as I already said, everybody is talking about emerging markets. And for the time being, the business model requires emerging markets, even in order to get relation between themselves, to get through a mature market, an advanced economy. But whenever there is a problem in one of the advanced economies, the relation between emerging markets also suffer. And this is not good for the global output, global growth, global economy. So we, if we want emerging markets to play a more determining role in the making up of the global economy, we need to establish an intra-emerging markets network. And this is why I am, I am really uh, traveling so much. Can I, can I um, uh, just say something about As a uh, closing Abraham. remark, okay. Right, well, as a closing remark then, let me just say, um, I'm on the board of the World Federation of Exchanges. Ibrahim is as well. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that um, he's been there for a relatively short period of time, but he's made a very significant impact. Um, for example, uh, I was in Rio with him, where he took a major lead at the Rio Plus 20 conference and helped drive uh, a resolution through the board last week, at, or two weeks ago, at the World Federation uh, of Exchanges, um, uh, where sustainability should be an issue that uh, stock exchanges deal uh, with. Uh, the question of how that relates to reporting requirements is very, very important. But it's very, very important that we have the discussion and start to have the discussion. He helped drive uh, that uh, consideration. Uh, as I say, he helped drive the outcome of the direction in terms of the uh, leadership, the management of the World uh, Federation of Exchanges. Um, he uh, has quietly but effectively insisted that for the first time, the World Federation of Exchanges deals with the issue of emerging market. So as opposed to simply be a sounding board for the larger markets like some of the rest of us. That doesn't mean that the existing markets uh, won't have a significant role and have the advocacy that a world organization should have, but, not, uh, but at least it should be in parallel with the issues of emergency markets. So not only internally have we seen uh, the Istanbul Stock Exchange taking on a very forward-looking direction and having the exchange become part of uh, a very significant part of the eco uh, ecostructure, the financial ecostructure, with the recognition uh, that um, capital markets have to be very central to the uh, financial ecostructure of a country and a region. But also, he's pushing those issues on a global basis. What is the amount of effective, effective kinds of um, uh, disclosures that should be made. Uh, you can't have everything uh, uh, on a piece of paper demanding volumes and volumes and reams and reams of wasted paper, but you should have the relevant information. Uh, he was pushing, and I, I recall, uh, that the WFE has to take on governance issues and become a model because governance is central to what stock exchanges have to insist on in terms of what listed companies are about. So these directions not only are happening here, and I uh, hate to flatter him because you know how he gets, 
But um, the truth of the matter is, uh, in a relative period of time, he's become a very, very important and driving player uh, on the global scene of world markets. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Mr. Rashid, as a closing remark, one sentence, if you would like to tell. During this crisis, there are opportunities where each exchange has to take advantage of. And I think all what we need to do is just to dig into ourselves and see what can we do to our exchanges. And I think we could, we could, do, uh, or we could have a different uh, look for our exchanges. Okay, thank you. Roland? Just a comment on, we have been debating a lot about the risk and the opportunities, but at the end of the day, we should never forget that an exchange has two functions, raising capital, and again, raising capital is, we should revert back to what's the meaning of a raising capital. I mean, today, exchanges, for most of them, are just writing down the name of the company on the blackboard. They don't really help raising capital. Raising capital is about allocating shares in a very efficient way equally, there's a lot of equality across all the investors. And this is something which has been more or less gradually forgotten. So never forget the two roles of exchanges, raising capital and secondary trading in this sequence. Just make sure that at the end of the day, the fundamental of the capitalism is still there. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Frank? Yeah, I mean, um, just one word. I've been at the difference between um, developed market and emerging market, I mean, we have pretty much the same similar task. Yeah? In the future, it will be questions how we are able to support our real industry by financing the future. And that's typically for small enterprises in Germany pretty much the same as it might be here in Turkey. And, um, of course, we have a solution that is our core objective in the future, really to finance the industry for further growth. But that is important for the society. Okay. Monsieur? Yeah, I think we are all impressed by um, the development of Turkey over the past, uh, let's say, 10 to 15 years. Um, Turkish financial institutions have become references in the way banks should be managed overall. They are doing very, very well and they are attracting uh, investments from everywhere in the world, from developed countries, but also from emerging countries. Um, I think there is a challenge there for the exchange to uh, become uh, a similar reference in the world of exchanges as Turkish banks have become uh, among emerging markets and even more broadly uh, uh, banks in the world. Dear panelists, thanks for your contribution and thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to thank the distinguished members of the panel. Konuşmacılarımıza teşekkür ettikten sonra sizleri kısa bir kahve molasına davet ediyoruz.